Um, thank you all for coming. My name is David Lang. I'm the artist in residence here at the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, and one of my jobs here is to um, help to bring things of cultural import to campus. And so as part of that, I have been running this um, uh, cultural salon this past year. And, um, and I also run a concert series. I just want to let you know a little bit about what we have. We have our great guest, Hal Foster tonight, which I will get into in a little bit. Um, we've had a very nice salon series so far. Um, we have had um, Frank Snowden talk about his book on the history of the effect of epidemics on culture. We had Alex Ross talk about his book, Wagnerism. We had Emily Wilson talk about her upcoming translation of um, the Iliad. Um, we had Billy Tsen and Todd Williams talk about the plans for the Obama Library. And um, I am happy to report that the next of these salons after tonight is going to be May 13th, where the artist Carrie Mae Weems will um, come and talk to us about um, the body of work that she has been making during um, COVID. So it's going to be really interesting, and um, we hope that you can make it. And we also have some concerts coming up. So on the 20th um, of this month, we have the um, composer, singer, and performer, and technologist Pamela Z, who's going to be performing from her studio in um, San Francisco. And on April 24th, the last concert of the season, we are going to have um, the great young string quartet, the Jasper String Quartet, doing um, one of Beethoven's greatest and weirdest pieces, uh, the C sharp minor string quartet, one of his last pieces, which is um, 45 minutes of um, expansive and intense um, wildness, plus music by a young um, composer named Shelley Washington, who is still a student here at Princeton. So that's going to be a really great concert, and we really hope that you will show up to all of those things. So now to tonight. Um, tonight's guest is Hal Foster. I'm not going to give a big introduction. Um, Hal Foster is um, one of our leading art historians and critics. So Hal Foster um, originally went to school across the street, then um, went on a journey of um, um, going around to different places, doing incredible things, um, working in Art Forum, head of the Curatorial Studies Program at the Whitney, et cetera, and now um, is back across the street as a distinguished professor um, at Princeton in the Art History Department. Um, he has written lots of books. I have to mention one which is on um, which I particularly got a lot out of, which was this um, amazing book, Conversations About Sculpture, which he made, which is just a, a very beautiful and rev revelatory um, bunch of conversations that he had with the artist Richard Serra. Um, but he's written many books, including um, a book with um, the Institute's own Yves Alain Bois, who um, is a distinguished faculty member here at the Institute. Um, he is here tonight to discuss this book, Brutal Aesthetics, um, which just came out. Um, and there's one little bit of bookkeeping that I wanna say um, before we get into the lecture, which is that if you have a question, um, just click on the chat button below and just write your name. You don't have to tell me what the question is. Um, because I'm not going to be that kind of moderator. But if you just put your name in the, in the chat, I will call on you in the order in which you are, and then you can ask your question of Hal. And I really hope that you have some questions, so you should start thinking about them soon, because um, you know art um, is not my speciality, so um, I'm hoping it is yours. Um, OK, and without further ado, um, please welcome Hal Foster. Um, thanks, David. You know, it's it's so great to have you at the Institute. Um, your programming, but your presence uh, is fantastic and such a gift to the entire Princeton community. Um, 
let me maybe share my screen. Modernism teaches us how to survive civilization, Walter Benjamin wrote enigmatically in the early 1930s. It had to teach us and we had to learn, Benjamin thought, because the humanist tradition had failed to prevent both the devastation of world war and the violence of fascist politics. Civilization had thus become barbaric in its own right. To this perverse turn in history, Benjamin answered with a dialectical twist of his own. Modernism teaches us how to survive a barbaric civilization through a positive barbarism of its, of its own. One that aims to be equal to the new poverty of experience at large. And among other idiosyncratic examples, he mentions the schematic figures of Paul Clay, like this one here. What does poverty of experience do for the barbarian, Benjamin asks? It forces him to start from scratch, to make a new start, to make a little go a long way. Like everyone else, Benjamin thought the worst had come with World War I, with what he called the tiny, fragile human body caught in a force field of destructive torrents and explosions. But in fact, the worst didn't arrive until the mass deaths of World War II, the Holocaust and the bomb. Only then was one truly forced to start from scratch, to make a new start, to make a little go a long way. In these circumstances, what ground could artists and writers claim? What means adequate to the destruction all around them? What but the most basic, the most brutal. In this book, I'm interested in the pervasive turn from the mid 1940s to the mid 1960s to the brute and the brutalist, the animal and the creaturely, as these are manifest in the early work of Jean Dubuffet, Georges Bataille, Asger Jorn, Eduardo Poluzzi, and Klaus Oldenburg. Each of these figures proposes a different version of brutal aesthetics, one that strips art down or reveals it to be already bare in order to begin again. But to what ends exactly? Why does Dubuffet invent the medium of art brute or <clears throat> raw art? What does Bataille seek in the prehistoric cave paintings of France? Why does Yorn populate his cobra paintings with creaturely figures? What does Palozzi, oops, what does Palozzi see in his monsters assembled from industrial debris? And why does Oldenburg remake cheap products from urban scrap. To begin again is almost a contradiction in terms. These figures want a clean slate only to find an overwritten one. They seek foundations only to find that they are like quicksand. Like Robinson Crusoe, whom Dubuffet and Oldenburg adopted as a persona each washes up on an island of his own devising, only to discover that it too is treacherous terrain. Among the tricky questions, I, I think it would be very hard to clear the river in the south. If everyone could please mute themselves, that would be great. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, among the, the tricky questions I encountered in this book are these. How could Dubuffet imagine an art that is unscathed by culture? What did Bataille hope to unlock in the enigma of a first man depicted as a beast? Why did Yorn figure political crisis 
in the form of human animals? How did Pelosi pick out a path to survival through the ruins around him? And finally, why did Oldenburg stake his hope for metamorphosis in junk? Some of my figures such as Dubuffet and Oldenburg are well known. Others such as Jorn and Pelosi are less so, at least in this country. In each case though, I focus on early work and highlight aspects that are less familiar. For instance, I take up the tie, the, the post-war prehistorian, not the pre-war dissident surrealist. In doing so, I aim to reposition, even to revalue these artists. At the same time, I don't apologize for the ways that they, all straight white men, are marked by the sexism and racism of their, their time. I have soft spots, especially for Jorn and Oldenburg, not so much the others. But in any case, I mean, the point I want to make is that the avant-garde that concerns me here is not very heroic. It doesn't usually pretend that it can break absolutely with the old order, social, political, symbolic, or found a new one. Rather, it often seeks to trace fractures that all already exist within the given order to pressure them further, even to activate them somehow. And maybe there's a resonance uh, here with some contemporary practice. Let me just mention um, a few concerns of the book. One is with this category of art brute that is invented um, by de Buffet, uh, often translated as, as raw art. But again, his, his definition was art that was somehow unscathed by culture. Now his first avatar of art brute was the child. And he adapted the art of children in his early work in this mode. But quite quickly, he gave it up. He, he thought that the art of children was in fact to dictionary, that's his term, that was somehow coded. It had a language of its own. Signs were repeated, like here are the signs for breasts. Um, so he, he ditched it and he went on to another version, another avatar of art brute. And this was the art of the common man, the man on the streets as he called him. And he had in mind primarily graffiti. But here too, even as he had attempted to assimilate graffiti to his painting, he quickly ditched this version of Art Brut because it was again too scripted, uh, almost automatic in its gestures. And he, he discovered the same thing with his third version of the avatar, I mean of the Art Brut, the, the avatar of, of the art of the insane. He, he assimilated it, acculturated it, and then ditched it. And this this is his double bind um, to seek uh, an art brute, an art outside of, of culture only to discover that it is always already cultural. And my other figures have related double binds that, that trip them up. Another concern of the book is uh, with origins. And, in fact, the riddle of origins, how they're never absolute, never uh, pure. And this is uh, foregrounded, especially um, in my chapter on Bataille, right? take up his fascination with Lasco in particular. Lasco was discovered in 1940, about a decade later, uh, Bataille um, begins to work up his great book on Lasco. Uh, for him, the human emerges in this moment, and not only the human, the, the kind of signal traits of the human, religion, art, um, but it's, it's a very complicated origin because it's always ambiguous. I mean, what is the relation of the human to the animal? Is the animal beneath the human? Well, then why are these 
paintings such that animals are, are presented with such grace and humans are presented as almost formless like the stick figure here. So the, the animal also represents the divine. Uh, so where are we in relation to the animal? Where are we in relation to our own humanity? So here the riddle of origins is never quite solved. And again, this is one um, aspect of this project of this book is to work out this search for origins. Uh, and my figures to a, to a man discover that that's an impossible search. Another interest in the book that surprised me was a consistent concern with sovereignty, with power. Um, those of you who know Bataille know that this is uh, a deep subject in his work, but it, it runs through my other figures too, um, especially after World War II, where there's a crisis in political authority you know, what is the nature of sovereignty? And here I show you um, a sculpture by Pelosi that asks that question and I juxtapose it with the famous frontispiece of the Leviathan. Uh, another um, question that I ask again and again in the book concerns different um, models of practice, of artistic practice, different models of the artist. And I think here there's a shift away from the modernist as constructor, a new man constructs a new world, engineers a new way of life as in this uh, famous self-portrait by the Russian constructivist Elizitsky, the constructor, where he seems to invent um, a whole new language. Um, there's a shift from this, the modernist as constructor, as engineer, to the artist as scavenger, as bricolure. Um, here we see Pelosi work in, in a, the lost wax method to assemble his, his sculptures out of bits and pieces. And the, the, the idea of bricolage, of the bricolure is, is developed by Levi Strauss, um, in this moment, he actually develops it in re relation to Art Brut, which fascinated him. There's another shift that concerns me in the book, and that's in the to do with the figure of the animal. Um, and again, reductively, schematically, for mar modernists like Franz Marc, the animal was in a way like the child, a figure of pure vision. I mean, Mark has this great line um, in his diary when he asks, you know, what would it be like to see nature as a deer does? So this desire for a vision outside of history, outside of society, outside of convention. The animal in my moment, among my cohort of artists, uh, has a very different cast. Uh, it becomes creaturely. It signifies a, a denatured condition, not at all a, a pure one. And then just another shift. I mean, it's a continuity and a, and a break. Um, one of the, the great emblems for Benjamin of uh, a modern figure who shows us how we might be able to survive the civilization bar that's become barbaric is Mickey Mouse. And he, he had in mind the early uh, Disney films like Steamboat Willie, in which uh, Mickey and Minnie are able to transform anything. Um, anything, in fact, that, that wants to do them no good, uh, to transform them into instruments, even musical instruments, David. Um, and so he's a figure who not only survives in these films, he loses limbs, he loses lives and persists, but he, he not only survives, he transforms the world. And um, for Benjamin, this was 
I think he was an instructive figure for how we might not only survive, but thrive in our modernity. Mickey is also picked up, of course, by pop artists. Um, and in Oldenburg too, he's a, a, a figure of, of metamorphosis. The trope for transformation in, in Oldenburg is the ray gun. And here in this drawing, which is in a way a kind of codex for much of his work, you see how his ray gun not only um, annihilates, but illuminates, um, that it destroys in order to create. And, ice cream cone becomes Mickey, Mickey becomes a mountain, a ray gun becomes a leg and, and so on. But towards the end of this engagement with Mickey, um, Oldenburg, you know, who saw it, Mickey as a kind of model of metamorphosis, comes to see Mickey um, as Disney hardens into this industry, he comes to see Mickey as this uh, kind of reified uh, logo of everything wrong with American culture. And he, um, the Mouse Museum becomes like a, a mausoleum. Maybe there I will stop my share and see all of you. Let me just um, mention a couple of other interests in the book and then uh, fall silent. Um, most of my artists are involved with a, a brute materiality. They can return painting and sculpture um, to a you know, very raw material state. Um, they're interested in medium impurity, not medium specificity. And formally, this means often a, um, an attack on the basic opposition that governs so much repre representation, the opposition between figure and ground. That's a modernist concern, but it it takes on a, a very different valence among the artists that concern me here because it's not a way to move into abstraction, this deconstruction of figure and ground oppositions. It's a way to push figuration into disfiguration. And you know, that's you know, the formal logic. I think the psychological implications are that they are um, very interested in, not in, in sublimation, but in desublimation. They practice, they play out different uh, forms of, of regression. Um, de Buffet was happy to be called a caca east. Um, Oldenburg said also happily that he was a shit artist. Uh, Polisi talked about his mud language. So there's a way in which um, Representation here is violent, it's destructive, but they also see in this destruction a, a way to another kind of uh, creation, another kind of transformation. Metamorphosis, again, is an important word for Oldenburg, also for Pelosi. But this also means that they're very ambivalent about language. Um, I'm attracted to artists who write well, uh, speak well, um, and these guys do, but they also they they treat language to mess with it, to mangle it, um, and that fascinates me throughout the book. Um, in fact, Du Buffet and others they they want to ex-nominate art. He's interested in art brute because he says, and this for me is the best definition of art brute. He says it's art that doesn't know its name. And here, I think they, they need to be seen as quite distinct, these artists, quite distinct from the um, inflated line of, of uh, Duchamp, who of course saw art as a process of nomination, at least in part. I declare this urinal a fountain. Um, my artists run in the opposite direction. They want to um, strip language, coded language away from art. And again, this is part of this desire to reclaim, uh, if not an origin, at least a ground uh, to make art anew. 
This also means that they're hostile to the classical tradition, I guess that goes with it saying, but um, ambivalent about the humanist tradition. Um, they're not yet the anti-humanists of the generation that follows them. Um, they're quite conflicted about um, humanism. Uh, Oldenburg says at one point, I'm a humanist bastard. Um, does that mean that he's bastarded by humanism? I'm, it's not really clear to me. Uh, but he does say again and again that he wants to make hostile objects human, which I take to be a humanist project. Um, just a couple more general points. Uh, hostile to the classical tradition, ambivalent about the humanist tradition. I think they, they feel, um, not quite, quite consciously, stuck in history. Um, Dialectical ideas, dialectical thought um, doesn't really work for them anymore. They remain, remain critical, but uh, they, they want to negate, but not to go beyond. They, they negate to subvert. And I quote this, um, this great phrase from Bataille in a letter to um, Alexandre Kojève, who was the great interpreter of Hegel to the generation of Bataille in Paris. Bataille writes to Kojève that he has, uh, what, what is it, uh, unemployed negativity. And I think that's true of, of all my figures or almost all my figures. So, um, there's somewhere between the kind of foundationalism of, of some of the great modernists and um, some of the deconstruction of the great post-structuralists that, that follow them. So stuck in history, that means they're also uh, stuck politically, or at least um, they often are problematic politically. Uh, Dubuffet, uh, and Bataille in particular. Um, we can talk about that if you like. Jorn um, was a tried and true Marxist and he became an important situationist, um, but, but none really has a, um, and at least in my, the period that concerns me, a, a political project. They, um, they don't really know to whom they speak. Um, they don't have a, a collective. I mean, Jorn, more than any of the other figures, really seeks out a collective addressee, but um, does not really find one in the end. I should just end now with uh, a few problems, which I, I know are problems. Again, I mentioned they were all white, straight men. White, white straight men. Um, I guess my question is, must we burn them? Maybe. Um, it could be that the, the search for an outside to Western civilization, I mean, this we saw this in modernist primitivism, this, uh, this turn to brutal aesthetics is a slightly different thing, but it, it might be that this search for an outside is an evasion of the history of the moment, especially anti-colonial struggles of the time. And this, this sense um, of an end to history, of a, of a post-history, and in a way, especially in Bataille, his interest in prehistory is a way to think through a post-history. It could be that this sense of an end, end of history, which is familiar to us now, is a blindness to other histories. They just don't see what the history in their own moment has, has opened up new kinds of uh, subjects of history, new kinds of struggles. Um, but I, I still want to insist on, on the critical or at least the caustic register of these practices. And that's really what interests me. So maybe I'll, I'll just stop there.
Thank you very much. That was really great. Um, people, please ask your questions in the chat. Just put your name in the chat and I will call on you. Um, you know, I, I want to ask one thing about the the um, the man woman thing, right? I mean, I know that you just mentioned it, and I know that you mentioned it in the preface to the book, um, but um, but it seems like a lot of the work itself is very male. You know, there's so many things which are um, uh, you know the ray guns, um, which are really um, phalluses, and in fact, there are phalluses that look like ray guns. Um, you know, there's so many things that actually are um, are really about um, you know kind of male business, and um, and um, Paolazzi's um, you know fetishization of science fiction and and things like this. You know that lead to pop culture, and and I just wonder if there's um, something in this whole reaction to the world that they are reacting to that is um, sort of makes them go back to that place. Well, I'm not sure they ever left that place. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that they, they could, that they had it in them, really. Um, and I, I can say, and I, this seems like an apology, but I, and it never really satisfies me, but I can say that they are troubled as men. I mean, this, um, these are, um, again, disfigurations that suggest a, um, an ego in crisis, um, often in the portraits of Du Buffet and Pelosi in particular. And I would say in Yorn too. Um, and I, it's it's not as if at least some of them don't see the problem. I think um, I mentioned that Oldenburg, one of his mottos is is to make hostile objects human. Um, I think one way to think about his his art in general is to uh, reimagine, refigure subject object relations, and that includes. Uh, relations of gender, relations of sexuality, too. Um, Oldenburg, in particular, um, was quite kind of metamorphic in his, I shouldn't say and put him in the past tense, he's still very much alive, mm -hmm. um, in his personae, uh, in his performances. Um, but by and large, they, you know, they are, you know, what is, Althusser say about ideology, they, they bathe in it. This, the, the sexism, the racism of the time cannot be stripped away from them, nor, I, nor should it be. I mean, we have to understand them in their problematic complexity. We have a question from uh, Cheris Thompson. Thank you, uh, this is so interesting. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, so I, I've been reading quite a bit of uh, work by critical race scholars about this period, um, noting how the um, stuff around humanism really um, bifurcates so that the kind of ontogenetic and phylogenetic relations that whiteness gives you, both with, in with innocence, it naturalizes and normalizes, um, to make you like an animal, to say, oh, it's in nature. Um, but for other groups um, to say it's more like an animal is to say that it's subhuman. Um, and then on the other side from the artists like Nam June Paik and others in this period, in the um, uh, Asian Americans, and I'm thinking of the contemporary poet Margaret Ree, whose work I love, Robot, and some of her written work has been talking about how Asian Americans in America are always already machines so that that future or that innovation or genius or if you like of the of whiteness is all a different kind is a kind of atavism is a subhumanism for the other so this this tension that we have at the end of the 19th century of atavism versus versus evolution and progress for within whiteness 
becomes something that bifurcates out to different racial groups and does really different work around these boundary figures of the child, the animal and the machine in this war and post-war, second world war and post-war period. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if that resonates at all, if you have any thoughts about that and, and thank you so much for the lovely talk. Thank you. I mean, that was, that was a brilliant um, review of um, that literature. I, I'm not sure what more I, I can add. I, um, I do think that there is a, a shift here. I mean, I, I mentioned um, a few shifts, but there is, I mentioned the shift from the animal to the creaturely, um, from a modernist idea, the animal to whatever this creaturely form is in a figure like Yorn or a figure like Pelosi. I, I think there's also um, a shift from the uh, the machine, the, the kind of technophilia of many modernists to um, the monster, uh, which is really what the, uh, the machinic uh, figures in Pelosi are. Um, now, how they they play out with um, how they relate to developments in accounts of race, um, I can't really say on the the uh, spur of the moment. Um, in at the time that um, concerns me, especially with De Buffet and Bataille and in Paris, among you know colleagues. Um, or at least acquaintances, um, there is important work done in race. There's the um, these UNESCO papers that are commissioned by the likes of uh, Levi Strauss and Michel Larisse um, on race and history and race and culture. Um, but to what extent that um, you know was part of the the ambience of of De Buffet and Bataille, it's not really clear to me. I'm, I'm, I don't think they're really, um, they're really there yet, uh, but I, I would love to talk to you more about it. But I, you know, you pointed to a partial blind spot of my own. Um, do we have some more questions? Will someone else join us? Uh, I have a question. I don't know how to do this on chat, but go right ahead. Jump in. <laughs> yeah. Well, I in in relation to um, Franz Mark, um, uh, I you mentioned that the animal assumes what you called a denatured condition. So I was wondering what you meant by that. Yeah, I didn't, um, that wasn't my claim in relation to Franz Marc. Uh, you know, I love his animal paintings. For me, they're the, the greatest of all animal paintings. Right. Uh, but for Marc, the animal was um, a figure of, uh, at least of the search for a pure vision. This is how I understand him. I think this is how he understood that aspect of his project, which was cut short by his death in World War I. Um, you know, I, when I read, I think as an undergraduate at Princeton, that, that note about, you know, how does a deer see the world? It's one of those notes you read as a kid or maybe not as a kid that, you know, change your life a little bit. Um, you know, suddenly you're, you're asked to see if, universe from a different perspective. So I, I love that idea of the animal as a figure of pure vision. Of course, we know how problematic that ideology of pure vision can be. What I meant to suggest is that for my artists, and here I had in mind in particular, Asger Yorn, the animal, you know, a little bit like as the machine becomes a monster in Pelosi, the animal becomes a creature, becomes, he called it a human animal, um, very distorted, very disfigured. And 
here I'm indebted to the work of um, my friend Eric Santner, who has argued about the creaturely uh, in Kafka and Benjamin, Sebald, that it's um, when it emerges, it's often the sign of um, the of an exposure, an obscene exposure to power. That we that the creaturely in those authors, um, according to Santner. Uh, is expresses a kind of cringe before authority. And um, I extend this idea uh, to, to see the creaturely as a symptom or a sign of a political crisis. And I think that's how Jorn uh, imagined his creatures as uh, figures of a of a post-war world um, in which the political order was manifestly in crisis. And this was his way to express it. So it's really a, sh a dramatic shift away from Mark. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that. Great explanation. Thank you. You know, the image that you had up when you had the Franz Mark up was um, was an Oscar Jorn um, painting, which I think was called Shameful Paradise. That's another one, uh, Shameful Pastoral. But Shameful, it has Shameful Pastoral, yeah. yeah. So, and what I thought when I saw that combination was here's this, um, you know, these beautiful animals, which um, are sort of, um, you know, noble and show a kind of idealized beautiful world. And then this other thing has to do with sort of um, survivor guilt of having made it through the war and, you know, this kind of shame of um, being able to see these things. And it sort of um, put the rest of the talk into a kind of um, context about the anti-heroic trying to build something out of the scraps or... Yeah, I mean, maybe that was a way that I missed to respond to your first question about masculinity, that um, not only is there a creaturely cringe in some of these images, um, but there's also a shameful countenance that another uh, painting by Jorn that I showed of a creaturely figure is, um, is titled the, the Timid Proud One. So, um, conflict ambivalence is inscribed in the very naming of the of the creature. But yeah, I mean, um, one of the extraordinary things about Jorn is that he, um, in this process of disfiguration, this production of human animals, he, um, he also uh, undoes uh, the given genres of painting. So shameful pastoral um, subverts landscape and he, he really marches through the portrait, history painting, still life and renders them nasty. I mean, his, um, so he has not only shame, but another good old modern or modernist um, affect, he has real spleen too. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the shameful is, is there for sure. It does go to the other question that I asked, you're right. Um, so you chose these people. Um, I, I know that I, I know that Dubuffet and Yorn are um, connected to each other. They know each other, but are were all these people connected to each other or? Um, in, in terms of interests, yeah. Um, Bataille and De Buffet uh, knew each other a little. I think they circled around each, each other skeptically, um, but they, they shared uh, at least some, some concerns. Uh, Jorn and, um, and De Buffet were, were pals and they actually played music together, David. Um, they right. did instruments and 
Um, the, the others, uh, uh, Pelosi and Oldenburg were very taken by Art Brut. It was very important uh, to their formation. Uh, they're, they're a bit, bit younger, but, um, you know, did I pick them? I mean, I, I, had, I had to do these lectures in um, DC at the National Gallery. <laughs> I had to come up with six, um, you know how this is, you get a commission and <laughs> you go for it. Um, I, you know, I think in a way, I, did I select them? I mean, I, as I say, I'm, except for Jorn and Oldenburg, um, I don't have any native affinity for them. I mean, I'm always fascinated by Bataille, but um, it's not like I love these artists. Um, and that actually interested me to work over um, my own resistance because, I mean, just take De Buffet, you know, for my generation, uh, he was very suspect, um, not only for the all the reasons that we've discussed, but um, and the extraordinary work that Evelyn and Rosalind Krauss did, um, what was it, 25 years ago on this um, idea of the formless, kind of an attack on form that runs through 20th century art, an idea you know, developed out of Bataille. Um, Evelyn and Rosalind present de Buffet in a way as a bad object because they argue that rather than really unform, he, he seeks in his materials um, a new form again and again. He's really, if you like, um, a formalist in disguise. I mean, Evelyn might dispute it, but um, so de Buffet was marked um, as a problematic figure for me a couple of times over. So um, I actually am interested more and more as I get older to take on projects where I don't have an obvious connection, um, an obvious affinity. Um, and that's true for, for many of these big people. We have a couple of questions here. We have a question from Philip Ording. Philip. Thank you for the fascinating talk. I, um, David was just asking about connections among the different artists that, that you spoke about. I'm curious about connections between those artists and um, more contemporary artists. And in particular, since your last book was on conversations with Richard Serra, um, if you thought that there were some threads of this tradition you've described that have persisted in in his work or his um, his contemporaries? Well, um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, you know, Sarah emerged at a moment when um, he wanted to uh, get away from minimalist objects. He, he saw them as products and get to uh, process. So materials, materiality, uh, is, was very important to him. Uh, and maybe there's a connection there. Um, and he certainly was formed um, in the you know, existentialist 1950s as a young person. But for me, the, the real genealogy um, at stake in this book is, is different. Um, I wanted to pick out um, a line in the avant-garde that was um, that cut across the the dominant Duchampian trajectories. Um, again, you know, Duchamp nominates De Buffet and others ex nominate, but um, it has to do with this idea of positive barbarism and a kind of um, a mimetic exacerbation of bad conditions as they exist as a, as a way to make work, make art. Um, and this, this idea of, you know, 
for me, it, it goes back to the great old line in Marx, you know, you must make petrified conditions dance again to their own song. Um, that this idea that an important aspect of modernism is a, as Adorno said, is a mimesis of the hardened, but it kind of enters into reified conditions to, um, to make them move again. As Oldenburg says, to make hostile objects human again. That line, um, which I don't think is a Duchampian line, has become more and more important to me. And, and for me, it, it picks out different people. So you know, rather than Duchamp, I want to propose Hugo Ball, the great Zurich goddess, and rather than Andy Warhol, Klaus Oldenburg. And in the present, I, I think there are many artists who follow this um, interest in mimetic exacerbation. Um, artists like, like Kelly, Isa Genskin, Thomas Hirshhorn, Rachel Harrison. Um, I think in a, in a funny way, they're kind of Oldenburgian. Um, you know, maybe we don't need another paternal line, but um, for me, it's always important um, as I, I began as a critic to kind of work out of the present and um, find in contemporary practice a way to think about historical practice anew uh, and vice versa, actually. Uh, so that's, that's my MO more or less forever. And um, it's there in this project as well. We have a question from David Ost. Um, <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. I do have a question, but I have to begin with a digression. About 30 years ago, um, I was looking for a title for my first book and I couldn't come up with it. And then I was just reading in a different field because I'm in political science. I was reading your book, uh, The Anti-Aesthetic. And I said, I got it, I got it. So my first book was titled uh, uh, The Politics of Anti-Politics. And so I always wanted to thank you for that inspiration. <laughs> um, and uh, the question is this, you mentioned um, El Lissitsky. And I just wonder, you know, I wasn't sure exactly what role, how you were fitting him in there. And then I was wondering in this context, because Elisinski, you know, he stayed in the Soviet Union till, till his death. And I wonder what the difference you could see between those, you know, Soviet artists and Russian artists who left, uh, who left and worked outside in the West. Did they have a different approach to, um, to these questions. Thanks very much. Yeah, no, th thank you. It's great. Um, I, I know your book, and I had no idea. I, I didn't actually patent the word or the suffix <laughs> anti. I, I, you know, um, but I, I appreciate it. The connection. Um, yeah. I, again, you know, Lizitsky. I just used him reductively as a um, figure of the modernist as engineer. This. Uh, an artist who feels that he can construct a new world. And um, of course he had, or at least he thought he had, you know, the winds of history at his back, you know, that there's a new order to be created. Um, so at least in that, that early moment um, after the Russian revolution, there was this idea um, that the constructivists could invent a new language of, of forms. Of course that goes south quite quickly and um, Lizinski escapes it mostly by his, his death. I mean, he becomes in a way a Soviet commissar, travels back and forth between Germany and the Soviet Union for a while, but he dies um, relatively young of tuberculosis. So we don't really know what his story would be. Um, but I, you know, I, I often um, think again, reductively of the modernist avant-garde in, in two ways. There's either um, an order, social order, a symbolic order to transgress, to attack, and like the Dadas, the surrealists, or in very um, particular circumstances politically, there's a, a new order to construct. And 
that's certainly what the constructivists felt that they had, at least for a period of time. But for me, these two models either um, transgress an old order or you legislate a new one, they leave out um, you know, so much in the history of the modernist avant-garde, um, in particular a condition when there, there is no stable order. And my, this is part of, this book is part of a, of a long project about the avant-garde at times of emergency when laws are effectively suspended, which as most of you know is much more of the 20th century, much more of the 21st century than we like to admit. Um, so I'm interested in moments when it's not really clear what the order is and what do artists, what do writers, what do philosophers do in that, that moment when um, there is no ground or no certain ground. Um, that obviously comes out of a concern with uh, our lives in this country um, since 9-11, and I've written quite a bit um, journalistically and otherwise on that score, but this project is about that a similar uh, state of emergency at mid-century, and, and now I, I need to go back to the late 19th and early 20th century to think about nihilism, anarchism, um, anarcho-syndicalism, um, you know, kind of many relations, many different relations between political formations and artistic ones um, that maybe you can help me with. Happy to, uh, you know where to reach me, I'm at IAS. <laughs> we have time for one more follow-up question from Anna Bokoff. Uh, yes, hi, uh, and thank you for a fascinating talk. I actually was going to ask about Lisiski and uh, and Pollock, of course, uh, but they're working in different times, as you just said, right? So Pollock is is working in the late four, I mean forties, fifties, and Lisiski dies in forty one. So, what I'm wondering is, what do you make of the uh, Lisiski's work in the thirties? Uh, in other words, um, you know his sort of photo montage work goes really through the window and uh, you know he does all this incredible I mean, magazines, the exhibitions, uh, well exhibitions are a little bit before, uh, but uh, certainly like USSR and under construction and many many others uh, where there's, uh, can we think of those as maybe sort of transitional towards what happens in the, in the 40s or do you really see the kind of the more as a break right so that in terms of mm -hmm. This idea of artist as a scavenger somehow. This is a really beautiful uh, term versus artist as engineer and constructive in your life. Yeah, I mean, it's so um, it's it's tricky because uh, I'm of a generation of um, North American, Western European modernist art historians who were too romantic about the constructivists um, and. Uh, maybe did not see the ways in which uh, they became complicit with uh, Stalinism. I mean, not not to a man. I mean, there were great constructivists who were gulagged and murdered. Um, but as you say, you know, Lisitsky, it's a complicated case as he moves through the 1930s. Um, but I, I also you know, don't want to give up my romanticism entirely. There's another position um, associated with uh, a historian like Boris Groys for whom constructivists were El like Elisitsky were really um, the uh, seed of Stalinist totalitarianism, this idea that all of life could be engineered, all of life could be constructed. And I don't really buy that argument either. Um, but I, I do think that there, um, there is a break between that um, constructivist initiative and the, um, the post-war condition of, of the artist as bricolure. 
uh, where they're, they're only ruins to be um, assembled, not, uh, not dams to be constructed. But, I, you know, again, I'd love to hear you say more too. I'll get in touch with several of you. <clears throat> um, on behalf of all of us, Hal, thank you so much for coming to um, talk to us and answer our questions. This is really fun. Um, you know. Please, um, let's all give um, Hal a Zoom round of applause. Wrong <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate it. See you around. <laughs>